the completest charlatan that ever lived. Payne still couldn't go back to England, so he decided to return to America. And Thomas Jefferson, the new president of America, agreed to send a ship to collect Payne from France. But the age of reason and Payne's letter to Washington had turned a huge chunk of American society against him by now. Back in Philadelphia, Payne was attacked by mobs throwing stones. He offered to work for the government, but eventually they stopped even replying to his letters. And then, during an election, as Payne was handing in his ballot paper, he was told he wasn't even allowed to vote, as he wasn't an American. Payne was almost penniless, and was taken in by a friend, William Carver. But even Mrs Carver couldn't stand him, and called him... A stinking atheist old troublemaker. William Carver described Payne's condition. His shirt was in tatters, and he gave off the most disagreeable smell possible, like that of our poor beggars in England. I got a tub of warm water and soap and washed him from head to foot, taking three times before I could get him clean. His toenails were like bird claws. If anyone from social services had come round, they'd have gone, Yes, Pop, of course you used to write books. I think he's getting worse this morning. He told us he once built a bridge across a field. Yes, look at that. We like drawing, don't we? Even the Quakers told him they decided not to allow him to be buried in their ground. One of the last conversations he had was with a doctor who tried to get him to accept that Jesus was the Son of God. They all failed, and on June the 8th, 1809, Payne died unrepentant. Even then, the English reformer William Cobbett tried to get Payne's bones brought back from America so that he could be buried in England, but the bones were lost and have never been found. Ever since then, Payne's legacy has burst out in dozens of different ways. In the town of Lewis, they named a beer after him. Throughout the 19th century, Luddites, Chartists and trade unionists referred to the works of Payne for inspiration. And in the 1840s in Manchester, there were reports of meetings at which 3,000 factory workers would turn up to hear lectures about him. A book about the history of Merthyr Tidfil, written in the 1860s, says... A few who thought highly of the rights of man and the age of reason assembled in secret places on the mountains and, taking the works from under a concealed boulder, read them with great unction. Has anyone ever read anything by a new Labour politician with any unction, let alone great unction? Could you imagine anybody sneaking up a mountain and going... <sighs> Modern politicians often like to say that their heroes are people like Payne or Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther King because deep down they know that no one will ever say, you know, the man who really inspires me is Jack Straw. We can't all be Tom Payne, but we can all be little Tom Paynes, changing a bit of history by being the first in the room to say, that's not right, we're not standing for that, so that everyone else goes, they're saying exactly what I was thinking. If Tom Payne has one thing to say to us, it's, make a fuss. This is the age of reason. He's now the right to man. Take off religion and monarchy. It was written in Tom. Donald Trump means business next on BBC Two, hiring and firing The Apprentice USA. Start a revolution in your head by going to the Mark Steele Lectures website. Find it at open2.net.